Okay, everyone. Um, welcome back to ELC three two zero four. So this is recording for uh lecture four of the optical part. Uh, this is recorded uh, actually after separately after uh the in person teaching. Uh, I will try to reflect on um uh students' responses and also questions uh from students. Um, I hope uh this recording is uh, of better quality. And I will share. Uh, so everything I've written on the whiteboard, I will share. Uh, uh, them here on the screen as well. So it will be helpful if uh, uh, you can you can write them down in your um, on a piece of piece of paper or uh, on your uh, notebook uh, step by step as well. It would uh, really help uh, um, to improve your understanding. Okay. So first of all, we. Uh, uh, let's review what we have learned uh, last week. Uh, we last week uh, we uh, it's it's about the nature of light. So what is light? We have ray, electromagnetic wave, and uh, photon uh, models of light. And secondly, uh, what is phase? So phase characterizes uh, how periodic functions propagate as wave. So wave can propagate in two directions. One direction is time, another direction is distance. So we have um, a phase in, in the time domain and a phase in the distance direction. Uh, so, uh, so we have angular frequency that characterizes uh, how fast wave propagate uh, in time. And we have propagation constant that characterize how fast we propagate uh, in distance. So refractive index uh, is defined as uh, the ratio between the speed of light in uh, vacuum and speed of light in uh, a, a medium. So this is proportionate to uh, the wavelengths uh, uh, ratio and inversely proportionate to propagation constant uh, ratio because of this relationship here. Okay, critical angle uh, describes when we have an impinging light um, uh, come to a surface, and then for the angle that's bigger than critical angle, uh, there will be no action. There will be only internal uh, reflection. This is how we keep light uh, content light uh, inside of a fiber. Acceptance angle describe how we get light in from outside of fiber to inside of the fiber. So for all the angles within the uh, acceptance angle, we can get light inside of the fiber and, uh, and, and we can guarantee that it is a critical angle inside of the fiber. So acceptance angle and critical angle together, they help to preserve the direction of light propagation. So besides the direction, we also need to preserve the um, the phase, optical phase of a wave. So I have single mode or multi-mode fiber. So mode here uh, represents a legitimate path for light propagation that can preserve uh, not only the direction, but also the optical phase. And then we also have attenuation, uh, which is also uh, known as loss. So in the slides, when you see loss, it's, uh, also, it, it's equivalent to att attenuation. And we have dispersion. So question here, do we want N1 and N2 to be as close uh, to each other as possible or as um, different as possible? So as uh, many students have uh, answered very cor correctly in class, we want N1 and N2 to be as close as possible as rule of thumb. We want N1 and N2 to be as close as possible because when uh, this critical angle here is close to a uh, sign of critical angle is close to one, so critical angle would be quite large. There wouldn't be much room for multi-mode uh, so rule of thumb is that we want single mode fiber because first of all, for multi-mode fiber, we have multiple paths, then we will have uh, 
the, all, all of these different passes, they will have different delays. So this cause uh, intermodal uh, di dispersion. So dispersion between different modes for multi-mode uh, fiber. The second reason is that when we have N1, N2, very different to each other, we need to do a lot of doping. So for when we do a lot of doping, it will cause uh, a lot of attenuation. So uh, as rule of thumb, we want N1 and N2 to be as close uh, uh, to each other as, as possible. So this also introduced challenges. First of all, when N1 and N2 are very close to each other, the acceptance of light into the fiber uh, become very small. So the light uh, getting in uh, needs to be very directional. Uh, so it needs to be like a laser, which we'll introduce today. And also the dispersion for single mode uh, fiber is also called intramodal dispersion. Uh, is dominated by a uh, chromatic dispersion where different uh, wavelengths uh, elements in the light source, they have a uh, different uh, speed of light and they will introduce different delays. So this cause dispersion. So what we want is uh, for, for laser, what we want is uh, very di directional and we only want one uh, impulse uh, wavelengths. We don't want a collision, a large co collision of wavelengths that would cause chromatic dispersion. Um, so we will look at that uh, uh, later uh, in the in the lecture today. So for multi-mode fiber, uh, uh, it is very suitable for uh, L LED. Um, so it doesn't have to be very directional light just get in and then propagate. Uh, through the fiber, through uh, multi pass, uh, multi mode. So, as I mentioned earlier in your coursework, um, so I really want to mention this one more time here today. Um, so, for your coursework, um, it's mentioned that a theoretical justification is uh, expected. So, uh, for uh, when, when you uh, decide how many modes there is, we normally have a line for the standing wave, and then we have another line for the uh, TE polarization. So if there is an intersection, there is a mode, legitimate mode, so legit legitimate path for the wave to propagate through the fiber. So this angle here is critical angle. So all the phases below critical angle cannot support any modes. So we just set them to zero. So question, if, um, if the polar, polar uh, so as a critical angle here, if the uh, uh, TE, uh, TE polarization line is uh, like this from this point onward. And then for the uh, standing wave, the curve is like this. Would there be an intersection? The answer is no, you wouldn't have intersection. So all the lines below critical angle, they, they do not have any meaning. So if we, if we connect these lines, there might seem like there is an intersection between this line and the dotted line. But actually, uh, as a critical angle, the T polarization value is still higher than the standing wave uh, uh, curve value. So th this is not an intersection. And afterwards, the T polarization curve is an increasing uh, function. And then the standing wave curve is a decreasing function. There will not be uh, uh, any intersection afterwards. So the, the theoretical uh, 
justification is very simple. You just calculate at a critical angle uh, which value is higher. So if the T polarization value is higher, there wouldn't be any intersection. And if he, here at critical angle, critical angle is here, so TE is lower, and this line has higher value here at a critical angle, then we would have a legitimate mode afterwards. Um, so you, you need to modify uh, my, my, my lab code a little bit uh, for the coursework. Um, uh, because in my, uh, in my, my, my lab code, I just directly uh, draw a solid line. And then if this line is below this point, it might seem that there is an intersection. I hope that's uh, clear. If it's still not clear, send me an email. I will explain again uh, in next week's uh, lecture. Okay, let's uh, have a look at the slides uh, for a bit. So today we're going to talk about a transmitter receiver of optical communication. So basically how to convert uh, electrical signal to optical signal as a transmitter. We'll look at this first. So this is very different from uh, re uh, radio frequency wireless communication where for radio frequency wireless communication, we uh, uh, modulate all the signal in the baseband and then up convert to carry higher a carry frequency and then transmit at the receiver, we down convert back to baseband and then uh, we uh, do demodulation. However, optical communication transceiver uh, uh, they, they operate based on the photon theory uh, of, of light. So we, what we need to do is we need to let electron to, uh, uh, to absorb, uh, to, to be excited uh, uh, to a higher level. And when, it's, uh, give, when it give, give up its energy, it will produce a, uh, a quantum of ener energy and produce a photon. So that's basically the only way to produce light. So let's look at three cases of uh, the electrons movement uh, between the energy levels. The first uh, case is uh, absorption. This is actually the basis for the uh, receiver. So at first, the initial state is that the electron is, at the, uh, is on the lower is at a, a lower energy uh, level, so it's stable. So when there is an incoming photon that gives uh, the electron of a quantum of energy, the electron will be excited to the higher uh, energy level. So this will generate uh, a current. This will lead to electricity, and we can measure this electricity uh, in order to uh, infer the, the light intensity. So this is, this is a basis for the receiver. And then for, sp uh, for spontaneous emission, uh, it is a foundation for, uh, for LDC. So uh, basically uh, the initial state is that uh, after we, uh, we excited an electron to the higher energy uh, level. The higher energy level is not stable. Eventually the electron will give up uh, its energy and the energy has to go somewhere. The energy would become a, a photon, it will become light. So, uh, so this spontaneous emission is a foundation for LED, where uh, the phases and the directions of the produced photon, they are not coherent to each other. So there is no guarantee which way it will go. It can go anywhere because you basically only released energy uh, to the free space, basically. And then the third case is a, a stimulated emission where 
we we try to make uh, the electron to stay at higher energy state for a little bit longer, just a little bit longer, although it's not still not stable here. We make the electron to stay here a little bit longer and wait for an incoming uh, photon. So when the photon strike this uh, atom, the electron will give up its energy and it will produce the second photon that, that is completely the same as the first photon. This is coherent light. This is like copy and paste. So when the electron give up its energy, it will copy and paste from the incoming uh, for, for, uh, photon. So this is how we generate a laser signal. So this is coherent light. We keep copy and paste. We get uh, light waves that is of uh, the same uh, wavelength, the same phase, the same direction. Okay, before we're getting into uh, more uh, bombardment of concepts, um, I spent a little bit of time to draw a map of all the uh, related atomic concepts. So I'm sure you have learned, um, um, I'm sure you have learned everything about, uh, for example, atoms and materials and semiconductors at different levels before from um, high school to uh, uh, different courses uh, throughout um, uh, your undergraduate study. Um, so what I want to do is I want to introduce a map uh, approach uh, here. Um, so if you, you can't see it very clearly on the screen, um, I will send this note uh, to you as PDF as well. Um, but hopefully you can, you can follow uh, this approach and uh, have a good understanding of why we, uh, how we build a semiconductor basically. So there are three levels for this map. The first level is atom. The second level is material. The third level is semiconductor. So for atom, first of all, we have uh, the, this first figure here. The center of atom, we have neutron and the proton. Uh, so neutron and proton, they form uh, nucleus, which is the center of uh, the atom. And then electrons, they are of uh, different um, shells that orbit around uh, the nucleus. So there are different layers, um, and uh, on different layers, there are different number of electrons. So the circles you see in this figure, they are called orbit. So the circles you see in this figure, they are called orbits or shells. So electrons, uh, they are moving, uh, uh, orbiting around at the center of the atom. So proton defines the chemical property. So all the atoms that have the same number of uh, protons, they, are, they belong to the same element. And the behavior of electron, they, uh, they define the chemical behavior. So uh, here we need to think of two concepts. The first concept is what is the condition for electrical neutrality? Secondly, what is the condition for chemical stability? So first of all, uh, because a uh, proton, they carry positive uh, electrical charge and uh, electrons, they carry negative uh, electrical uh, charge. So we need to have the same number of protons and electrons in order to have net zero electrostatic charge. So this is el electrical neutrality. And then for the chemical behavior, um, it is stable when the, the outermost circle has eight number of uh, electrons. 
So it will have, it needs to have eight number of uh, electrons in order to achieve chemical behavior. But lots of atoms, they do not have eight. So what, uh, so what they need to do, they need to form bonding so that atoms can share their uh, electrons. So this leads us to uh, the second level, with, which is material. So we need to form a uh, chemical bonding. There are um, different uh, types of chemical bonding. For the purpose of this course, uh, I introduced two types of bonding. The first type is uh, meta uh, metallic uh, bond. So for metals, normally we have either one, two, or three electrons um, on the outermost uh, circle. So all these uh, atoms will have to bond together and their electrons can, can be free, can wander free. Um, so that's why uh, metals are very good conductors. We have a lot of free electrons. It's like a cloud of free electrons. And the second type of bonding is called covalent bond. This is the foundation of a semiconductor. So this is uh, this figure here is an example. This is silicon crystal uh, lattice. So we have silicon atoms. For silicon, we have four electrons as a, uh, on the outermost circle. So each atom will have to bond with three other atoms, sorry, four other uh, silicon atoms so that they can have, um, all of them can have, can share eight uh, electrons in their outermost circle. So this links, you see, there are two coming out from uh, an atom uh, that forming a bond. So this two portrays two paths for the electrons. So you can see there are eight paths coming out of uh, each um, atom. So basically we have eight uh, electrons. So electrons, they can move uh, in the bonding structure, but they are not free to go outside of the bonding structure. So when bonding is formed, it is quite stable. It, it achieves uh, uh, chemical stability and also achieve the electrical neutrality because we didn't increase uh, extra uh, electron here. We still have, in, in overall in the bonding structure, we have the same number of uh, protons as the number of uh, electrons. So co uh, covalent bond is quite different from metallic bond because metallic bond, for metallic bond, the electrons are free. But when covalent bond is formed, uh, ele electrons can move in the bonding structure, but they are not free uh, everywhere. So the electrons on the, uh, that can move in the bonding structure, they are called valence uh, electrons or bonding electrons. And this level of energy is called valence band. So this is a stable uh, starters. So the covalent bond forms a mole molecule. So this is the foundation of a semiconductor. So valence bond is the energy bond that is uh, stable um, for, uh, uh, for electrons. Uh, however, if we have uh, external energy coming in here that break, um, uh, break the bond, then the electrons will become free. So we say the electron there become, f the process of electron become free is to accept electron from a valence band to a higher conduction band. So breaking of uh, chemical bond leads to um, the free electron created uh, onto the conduction band. So we have a 
band gap of materials, which is the energy uh, gap between the valence band and the conduction band. So for different material, uh, this uh, band gap is different. So basically we know that if we burn different materials, they can probably produce different colors of light. For example, if you, if you burn uh, copper, it will give you a uh, 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 purple light, if I remember correctly. So it's quite a kind of special type of light. So they are not all uh, white lights. So different co color of lights, they have different wavelengths. Um, so different wavelengths, they correspond to different uh, quantum of energy. So different quantum of energy is uh, energy gap or band gap between the two bands, valence band and conduction band. So on the, in the uh, conduction band, we have free electrons. For the sake of simplicity, we just say that on the uh, conduction band, we have electrons. And then on valence band, we have holes, which is op opposite to the free uh, electrons. Okay, and the holes and the electrons, they are also, they are both called carriers. Uh, because they, they will produce a uh, current. Um, so a uh, breaking of uh, uh, the bonding structure will lead to uh, free, a generation of free electron from uh, that that's uh, excited from a valence band to a conduction band. In order to make uh, this uh, dynamic um, happen more, um, more often, we do doping. So doping will completely change the dynamic of bonding. So what we do for doping, uh, typically we have P-type and N-type. For P-type, we dope borom which have three electrons. So in terms of uh, electrical neutrality, we'll have three uh, protons and three electrons for this boron. But this is not uh, good for the chemical uh, stability because this bonding structure uh, needs four electrons, which means here we have one hole that is uh, not very stable for the uh, for the bonding structure. So if the bonding structure move this hole, which means one electron is given to here, then it, it become chemical uh, stable, but not uh, electrical neutral anymore because we still only have three protons in here. So the trade-off between electrical neutrality and chemical stability will, will give, give up more degree of freedom to uh, either produce light or absorb light by jumping the, uh, the electron up and down between the valence band and conduction band. And the n-type is the opposite. We dope with uh, uh, for uh, for for Anyway, I has uh, sorry. I has five electrons, so I has a uh, one electron to 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 money. So in terms of uh, electrical uh, neutrality, it has five protons as well. So it kind of need all the five electrons. However, for the chemical stability, uh, it I have one extra electron here that doesn't have a proper location in the bonding structure. So the electron is attempted to, to move away. When it's moved away, the e electrical uh, balance would, would break here. So it's kind of a trade-off that can that actually attract um, uh, electron to jump up and down. So uh, after doping, we, uh, we have more uh, tools to uh, to make electrons to jump up and down between valence band and the conda conduction band. Um, so now we can build the third level, which is a semiconductor. 
the first example here is forward by uh, bias. So we have P type, P type on one side, N type on the other side. We apply a positive contact to the, to the P type, a negative contact to the N type. So there are a lot of electrons in the P type. So what would happen is because of the negative contact here, the electrons here will expel uh, each other and move towards the positive contact on the other side. So we'll cross over the barrier. The barrier is also called depletion uh, uh, region. So for the P type side, we have a lot of uh, holes that are attracted by the negative uh, uh, contact of the other side. So they are uh, attempted to move to uh, the other side, to the T type, uh, sorry, to the N type side. So basically, if you look at this, uh, uh, the higher band is uh, a conduction band, lower band is uh, the uh, valence band. So for the N type on the conduction band, we have a lot of electrons. They are moving this direction towards the positive contact. And then for the P-type, we have a valence band. Uh, we have a lot of holes on the valence band. They are moving the opposite direction towards um, the negative uh, contact. So the holes uh, on the valence band and the electrons on the conduction band, um, they will combine in the depletion region. And when the electron here uh, coming down to the uh, uh, valence band, it will produce light because hole and the electron, they combine here. So this is the result of uh, forward bias. For what forward bias does is to move colors to their minority size. So what is minority size? We have more electrons in the N type. Now moving towards P type. So in P type side, there are very little uh, electrons. So they are of minority. So we are moving the electrons to their minority side. Similarly, we have a lot of holes here in the P type and the very little holes in the N type. So uh, for N type is minority side of holes. So we are moving holes to their minority side. So by moving uh, uh, holes and electrons to their minority side, it kind of balance holes and the electric, it kind of complete the circuit. So this is forward bias. So when holes and the electric they are moving uh, towards each other, they will combine uh, in the depletion region and this will produce light. And then opposite to this, we have re re reverse bias, where um, we have a positive contact that's applied to the N type side. So N type side has a lot of electrons. So the positive charge will hold uh, the electrons very strongly. So that electrons are close to the positive uh, contact, moving away from the middle barrier region or depletion region. So the middle region is completely empty. Similarly, on the other side, we have negative empty. Similarly, on the other side, we have negative um, contact, which hold the holes to to be far away from uh, to to be far away from the middle region. So the middle region is enlarged, is empty. It doesn't have uh, it shouldn't have free holes or free electrons. So I have two energy levels down here. We have uh, a combustion band and the valence band uh, in uh, P-type. 
we have com a compaction bond and a valence bond in N type here. And then we have holes uh, here. Uh, they are moving towards uh, the negative contact. And we have electrons, free electrons here, they are moving towards the uh, uh, positive uh, contact. So the middle region is enlarged. So when light is coming to this region, so if we expose this uh, semiconductor to uh, to light, then the the power or a for, a for, photon, sorry, a quantum of energy is absorbed, and a, a new pair of electron and hole will be created in this region. And then the new hole will move towards the negative uh, uh, contact because it's attracted by the negative contact. So it moves towards where the other holes are. And then the electron is moved towards where all the other electrons are because we have a posit positive uh, contact here. So this is reverse biased, where carriers are moved to their majority sites. So electrons, uh, their majority site is n-type. We have a lot of electrons. And when electron hole pair is uh, created in the depletion, uh, depletion region, the electron is moved towards n-type, where all the other el electrons are. So it kind of uh, give us a, a capacitance, if that makes sense. So we have more and more electrons here and more and more uh, holes here. Okay, so the last two concepts we are going to mention. First of all, uh, what we build here is called uh, molecule junction. It's also called semiconductor uh, uh, junction. Another concept is how current is uh, 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 generated. So electrical conduction. So basically we have diffusion. It happens when there's no external uh, electric field. There's no positive and negative uh, contact. Um, but, but electrons, uh, they still diffuse in the material. It could be from background radiation. It could be from um, uh, heat. Um, but anyway, we didn't apply a positive and ne negative contact here, uh, ex external, um, any external electric field. But we can still have some uh, uh, current. So this is from uh, diffusion. Another. Uh, so the opposite is drift. This is uh, uh, the movement of electron under the influence of positive and negative uh, contact, like here, either forward biased or reverse biased. We have uh, drifting. So I hope I hope that's helpful. It's quite a lot of concept, and they kind of interconnect to each other. Uh, so later on, we will uh, still mention these concepts in a discrete uh, built it pattern. Um, it would be really helpful if you uh, try to understand uh, this map um, as best as you can. So try to look at this map, uh, look back on this map from time to time, and maybe listen to this part of recording uh, uh, again if you feel you want to. Uh, organize your uh, understanding again on all these concepts. I hope I hope this helps. Uh, if you have any suggestions, uh, send me an email. So if you uh, read any uh, books, materials um, on uh, audio communication, sooner or later you'll see bombardment of concepts like this. There's bonding, there's doping, and there's electrons, there valence electrons, there are free electrons, uh, there is uh, 
uh, conduction bands, there's drifting. Um, it's really important to uh, to uh, kind of distinguish the link between them. And this is the only way that we can um, understand them better. Let's come back, come back to the slides. So uh, now all of these three cases for absorption and uh, LED spontaneous emission and laser emission become really easy to understand. Question here. So we said here the higher energy level is called valence band. The lower energy level is called, uh, sorry, 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 really sorry. So the lower stable energy level is called valence band. And the higher uh, not stable energy level is called con conduction band. And the band gap, the energy between these two uh, levels is a quantum of energy, HF. So H is a constant called Planck's constant. F is a frequency that is a uh, speed of light over wavelengths. So this quantum of energy is a fixed value. So we call this a level, this a level. Why do we also call them band? Why do we call them valence band and uh, conduction band? Sorry, valence band is lower, conduction band is higher. So why do we call them band? So in the, in the, uh, during, uh, during the uh, in-person class, um, a student answer it better than I ever can. That's really impressive. So uh, basically, uh, for 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 this level, for higher level or low level, it is also a collection of discrete energy levels, and uh, we have fluctuation because of, uh, for example, heat, and also because, for example, laser. If we want electrons to stay in the conduction band a little bit longer, what we normally do is we provide a high and then the electron will uh, have the tendency to come down, but it will come down to a relatively high, but uh, it just give away a little bit of energy so that it can stay stable, um, uh, still stay in the conduction band a little bit longer. So basically, there will be variations here, but the variations, they are on the discrete uh, steps. So electrons, they can only take discrete steps of energy. So we have bands here. Um, that is uh, exactly why when we generate light, we have a, uh, we have a width of uh, wavelengths do not have only just one wavelength. We have a width. We have a width here. We have a, a kind of, it's, this is called line width. So basically we have a collection of wavelengths. It could be narrower for, for, re, uh, for, 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 for laser, but very wide for LED. So this is because we, uh, the upper level is a band, the lower level is a band. So the energy jump could be from any point in the band on, on the upper level to any point uh, uh, in the band, in the lower, uh, in the, uh, in, on the lower level, in the, in the lower band. Okay, uh, so uh, very importantly, how we generate a, a laser. Sorry, I probably keep mentioning uh, radar because I do a lot of research in radar, so I tend to say radar. Um, but there is absolutely no radar here. So if I uh, misspoke radar, I always mean laser in this, in this course. Okay, coming back, uh, basically we have a lot of electrons. So at the beginning, we need to kind of pump them, 
pump a lot of uh, electrons to the higher uh, energy level, which is uh, the conduction band. And then when the input uh, incoming uh, light uh, strike the atoms, then these electrons will give up their give up their energy, and it will be like copy and paste will have the same uh, light coming out. So in reality, how it how we generate all of this? So basically, we have this uh, structure. So we have two mirrors that are separated by wavelengths over two. So when we actually apply energy here. At first, we have a lot of spontaneous emission, like LEDs. We cannot control the initial state. It just happens that we have a lot of spontaneous emissions. But also, all of these spontaneous emissions of light, they are of wrong uh, wavelengths. So they cannot um, aid together constructively. They do not uh, get out, or if they get out, uh, they they would uh, dissipate very quickly because they are of the wrong wavelengths. Pretty soon, uh, it will happen randomly that uh, the right wavelengths uh, with the right direction uh, of light would happen. And then the light would come round and round like this, and then it will stimulate a uh, more and more uh, stimulated emission. So there will be more and more light that are of the same wave, uh, wavelengths and the same direction. And then eventually, uh, this part of uh, mirror is uh, semi-transparent. Uh, so when the power in here accumulate uh, large enough, it will emit as uh, uh, laser. So that's how we produce uh, laser. At first, it's still uh, spontaneous emission, but only the coherent light, they would accumulate. They will add together constructively, and then they will uh, output with uh, the right direction. So laser's full name is actually uh, light amplification by sim uh, stimulated uh, emission of radiation. So it's coherent in nature. So only coherent light they get out of that cover co coverty. So this structure, this middle space is called coverty. And then it could be monochromatic, uh, uh, which means we really just want one wavelength. In reality, uh, it's probably not really possible, but we can make sure that the band is as uh, narrow as possible. And then we, we need a pumping source to make, uh, to make more and more electrons to be uh, excited, to be excited before uh, an incoming light come over. So we need to have a lot of free electrons in the conduction band uh, to be ready for st uh, stimulated uh, emission. So we, we need to su uh, support, uh, we need to input power. We need to provide power for that. And also it has well-defined threshold for that. And also it has well-defined threshold for power to come out. So this, uh, so right-hand side is semi-transparent mirror. It's designed in the way that when the power inside is accumulated large enough, it will go out. So there is a, a threshold there. Okay, so let's laser. So basically, we'll look at this figure again later. So basically, we modulate uh, the electrical signal to a uh, density signal. We will use a uh, Mark Sender modula modulator. We'll look at this uh, in more detail later on. OK, so laser, we normally have, uh, so we need forward bias. So the current 
would go down this way from P uh, type to N type. And then in the middle, we also have uh, like a sandwich uh, section. Why? Because uh, we want um, we want light to be generated in the middle region, right? So uh, the end type uh, at the bottom is uh, highly doped. So here in the middle, we have a lightly doped uh, region where the, the band gap is smaller. So the band gap um, at the bottom end type is larger. And then the band gap in the middle is smaller. So more lines will emit in the in the middle uh, part of 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 uh, of, of this uh, junction. So the output actually um, actually is uh, something like this. So in terms of uh, wave lines, or if we say or target lines is uh, lambda. Okay, so basically, uh, so what we have for output is actually we will have multiple modes, which means we will have light that's output at lambda. We'll have light output at two lambda. We'll have uh, light output at all the multiple of uh, lambda. Right? We have basically we have no control over over this because they can all get out. They can all uh, uh, enforced in the cavity. Um, on the other hand, we have natural attenu uh, attenuation, which means we have a bell shape uh, power in the middle. Uh, so the mode in the middle has higher power, and then the mode um, on the side have lower power. So basically, we have multi-mode laser here. So the multi-mode uh, laser is completely different from multi-mode fiber. So multi-mode in fiber is for light to propagate in different paths in the, in the medium in fiber. But multi-mode uh, laser here is that we have multiple uh, wavelengths. So the whole um, the whole range of wavelengths can travel in different paths of multi-mode uh, uh, fiber, if not that makes sense. So we can allow multi-mode uh, fiber. For, so we, we do use multi-mode fiber, but we, we do not really want to allow multi-mode laser. We only want one uh, wavelengths, right? So what we want to do is we want to uh, make the separation between uh, uh, modes to be as far away as possible so that all the other modes, they kind of push out of the, of the gun region. So that's what we want to do. So in order to do that, we uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, a handwritten note um, that I wanted to write on the whiteboard here. So the purpose of this one is to determine the wavelength separation of different modes. So I have different modes. We want to know the separation between them. So basically for the resonance con condition, we need uh, so we have mirror here and a mirror here. We need the separation, the distance between two mirrors um, for generating a uh, laser to be a multiple of half of the wavelengths. So zero is the wavelength in a vacuum. We have refraction index. So this is the wavelength of, uh, in the medium. So we need half of the wavelengths uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiplied by an integer. So that's a wrong trip. 
is a multiple of uh, wavelengths. So we generate um, a laser with uh, target wavelengths. But here we have multiple mode because for, for the integer one, two, three, four, uh, they are all legitimate multiple uh, uh, wave, uh, wavelengths. We want them to, to be separated as far away as possible. So how do we do that? So now we look at the operating frequency. So uh, speed of light over uh, wavelengths. We have uh, this uh, operating frequency as a function of the distance between the two mirrors. Okay, and then the frequency sub separation, because uh, Q here, we can take integer one, two, three. We want to see the separation, the gap between these uh, integers in terms of frequency. So we just take Q equals one, we have uh, this function here for the frequency separation. Eventually, what we want is uh, we want the wavelength separation. So the, the interval wavelength, wavelength separation in comparison to the uh, target wavelength equals to the uh, frequency separation in comparison to the uh, target uh, operating frequency. So if we put uh, this to the other side, we can represent the wavelength separation as a function of this. And if we put uh, step three in here, eventually the wavelength separation is a function of this. So what we can observe from here is that the wavelength separation is inversely proportionate to the distance between two mirrors. So if we make the distance as close to each other as possible, so D as small as possible, then the wavelength separation is become higher. We want wavelength separation to be higher so that we push all the other modes outside of the gun region, right? So we, we need to manufacture two mirrors to be as close to each, each other as possible. But in reality, that's quite difficult to manufacture. Let's come back to slides uh, to look at this. So basically, uh, what, what we wanted before was to make to, to make the uh, wavelength separation to be as large as possible. And in order to make this wave, wavelength uh, 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 distant, uh, sorry, wavelength separation to be as large as possible, we need to manufacture uh, the mirrors to be as close to each other as possible, but that's not always possible. So what do we, what do, we do? What we normally do is we periodically dope the, the space between the two mirrors, okay? So the distance to, between the two mirrors is still large, but this is equivalent to have a smaller distance here. The smaller distance is uh, how we push the, the, the other modes outside of the gun region. So here in this figure, we have the, the target mode and all the other modes that are attenuated because they are pushed away. The distance here is small, although the distance between mirrors is still large, we periodically uh, dope the space between the two mirrors. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I think I, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I have explained this uh, very well in the um, in-person lecture. 
Um, I hope this is clearer here now. Um, okay, so modulate light. We can modulate, uh, for example, high low, high low by turn on and off uh, laser. But this has challenges. So first of all, when, when we turn on and off uh, laser, there will be delays. So because we need enough electrons to be pumped to the higher energy, because we need enough electrons to be pumped to the higher energy uh, level. But this this takes time. So as a as a, when we turn on laser, there's a delay. And also there is re relax relaxation or acceleration, which means when we when we first turn on the laser, there will be variations because when the higher energy level have enough uh, electrons, and then they produce uh, enough power for the for the laser, and then the number of electrons becomes smaller uh, on the higher level. Then we need more electrons to be uh, excited and then produce light. So the amplitude of light would fluctuate here. So if we, we use this fluctuation, uh, we, if we assume there is no fluctuation, and when it's on, it should be high state. Then uh, what we generated, uh, the signal we generated will, will have a, a fluctuation. So this will affect our detection capability. So what we normally do is we do not modulate light itself when we generate light. We just generate, so we just turn it on and then at the beginning, there will be fluctuations, but later on, it will be stable. We just let it be high, uh, let it to be on all the time. And then we use an external uh, optical modulator to modulate high and low. How do we do that? So we normally use a Mark Zinder modulator so what we do is we input a, a modulated, um, a modulated uh, um, uh, light, and then for the two arms, they are of different lengths and they are of different propagation constant, so their uh, uh, refractive indexes are different as well. So as output uh, of the MZM, the two arms, the signals from two arms, they will combine again, they will interfere with each other. If they are in phase, they will act together constructively, this represents a high state. And if they interfere with each other, uh, if they are out of phase, then they cancel each other. So we can have high and low for uh, that according to data. Question here, very, very important question. So if I say, uh, let me see if I can show it somewhere. Uh, let me just try to write in here. So in general, a wave is represented by in time domain omega t. Manner is propagation constant and distance. So this is, uh, this is uh, one light. And if we sp split this uh, to two arms, on arm one, we'll have sine Omega T minor is beta one set one. 
also half of the power. And then on the second arm, we'll have also half of the power. We have sine. Omega T minus beta two Z two. So basically the distance Z one, Z two, they are different. And the propagation constant beta one, beta two, they are different. So are these two waves still coherent are these two waves still coherent this is really really important question so the answer is that they are still coherent so we would think that these two phases because they are different so what is coherent of uh, uh, lights it is when two waves they have constant phase relationship so they, they do not have to be constructive. They do not have to be destructive. If they are constructive, they have to be constructive all the time. If they are destructive, they have to be destructive all the time. So because we modulate uh, this, uh, uh, the second part uh, to be different, it would have seems that the second part uh, would vary. But actually, when the light travel through arm one and arm two and then recombine they would have already traveled a fixed length of distance so z1 z2 they are not equal to each other but they are fixed constant and beta1 beta2 they are different from each other they are both constant predetermined constant so these two waves they have the same uh, uh, face a relationship with each other, they change periodically uh, uh, at the same speed defined by omega, the so, uh, angular frequency. And then the extra phase rotation here, uh, they are both constants. So these two waves, they are still coherent. So for example, uh, we played a classroom activity before so uh, there are two rows of students. If I give them uh, two lemons and ask them to pass on at the same speed, what, what I can do is I give the first row lemon uh, first and the second row uh, a little bit later, but they should pass on lemon at the same speed. So they would travel with a phase difference but they would travel at the same speed. These two waves, they are still coherent because they travel at the same speed. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So, uh, so basically, uh, Mark Sender modulation, we use uh, electrical, uh, electric field to change the propagation constant um, on the different arms. So question, what is the uh, uh, disadvantage of doing this? What is the dis disadvantage of using uh, electric of uh, external electric field to modulate a uh, signal, like uh, we modulate different phase rotation onto two optical signals? So what is the dis disadvantage of this? So basically we have, uh, so what we need to do here is charge and dis discharge uh, using a RC circuit. So we have a resistance with, we have uh, cap capac capacitance. So we do charge and discharge. This would take time. The delay is, uh, so we have R for resistance, we have C for capacitance. The delay would be R, C. So, so this uh, modulation would impose 
delay. And also electricity, they travel slower than light. Electricity travels uh, about two thirds of speed of light. So this could introduce delay. So whenever we introduce delay, uh, it will have impact on the bandwidth as well. We will look at this uh, RC circuit a little bit later in more detail. Okay, so basically we change the refraction index, and then, uh, and then uh, when they combine together the two waves, they are coherent waves, they will in interfere with each other constructively, destructively to represent uh, signal uh, level one or signal uh, level zero. Okay, so also uh, uh, challenges here. We have mentioned that uh, there is a delay. Okay, uh, let's briefly have a look at uh, uh, some modulations. So basically we have, uh, very often we have a non-return zero modulation or return zero modulation. So simply put, non-return zero modulation is often used. Now it is simple, just one zero one one zero one. So high, low, high, high, low, high. So it is like modulating a BPSK signal. So return to zero signal is uh, the NRZ signal multiply a clock. So when it is one, we have a high low with one period of original uh, NRZ period of time. And when it's zero, it's zero. And then when it's one again, it's also we have a vary here, variation here from one to zero. So question, which one uh, would take bigger bandwidth? So it is RZ because the symbol duration is halved here for the RZ. The symbol duration is smaller. So when here for the RZ, the symbol duration is smaller. So when symbol duration is smaller in the time domain, uh, the bandwidth would, would be doubled. So doing the in-person uh, teaching, a student answered this uh, very ex excellently. So this is uh, a very important like instinct in uh, a system design. So when we have smaller duration in a time domain, this signal will take up a large, larger bandwidth. So I have pros and cons for a return to zero modulation it would occupy double bandwidth. Uh, but return to zero would contain clock information, which is beneficial. But for, uh, to be honest, in a uh, fiber communication, we normally can just sy sy synchronize the clock between the two ends. So the clock information is not that important anymore. So we mostly use a non-return to zero uh, signal now. Okay, so I diagram. So after we transmit the signal as a receiver, we receive all the pulses. So what we normally do is we take all these segments, uh, we kind of clip, uh, take, take all these segments out and then overlap them to one diagram. It looks like an eye. So we often call it I diagram. So the openness of I diagram in the height here reflect how severe the noise is. So for example, we have a lot of noise, then the signal amplitude would vary more. Then the, the height would become smaller, so the eye would close. And then the width, the openness of the width would tell us uh, if there is dispersion so if inter-symbol dispersion happens, the symbol duration would overlap to the next one, and the, the next one will all overlap into the previous one. So the, the openness of the, the weight, uh, of, of the width 
will tell us how severe dispersion is. Um, so for modulation, uh, besides non-return to zero, which is basically BPSK, we can also have uh, PIM, which use uh, four amplitudes. Okay. Uh, so we can look at the I diagram here for four PIM. There is a very interesting observation here. So on the left hand side, we have the electrical signal. And then on the right hand side, after MCM modulation, we have the optical signal. So we can see that the middle eye here is wider than the two eyes on the side for the optical signal. But for the electrical signal, there's no such observation. Why did this happen? This is because MZM, uh, the mapping of Sorry, the mapping of uh, MCM is not linear. The mapping from electrical field to optical field is not linear. So we, we need to look at the theoretical model of MCM. This is actually very simple. So as I, I have written a little bit before, so I have two, uh, we have two uh, paths, two arms. The first arm, is this, the second arm is this. And when they com combine together later on here, they would interfere. So the intensity is the square of the two electric field uh, A together. And the previously we have uh, the first one, the second one, the A together is basically the square of the first one, the square of the second one, and the uh, first one multiply the second one two times. So the sim simple is tension. And then from here we can get we can transform that into a simple cosine function. Um, so this is actually quite simple. So I'm not going to uh, derive the de uh, detailed step anymore. And it's it's not. Uh, important in, in exams as well. So in the next lecture, I will show you some example exam questions. Um, you will be given all the important parameters and you will only need to remember remember the, the equations that describe definition. You do not need to uh, derive um, kind of uh, a lot of steps further away from the definition. Okay, so this is the famous transfer function of MZM. So what we do is we modulate the phase difference in the electrical field, and then the output optical uh, intensity is like this. The mapping is a cosine function. So if we use the entire pi range, the mapping is not linear. So V pi describes the voltage we need to your power uh, of phase change of pi. So if we use the entire range, then, uh, then on one side, we have the minimum phase rotation. On the other side, we have the maximum phase ro rotation. And then uh, it would map to uh, the high and the low in the optical uh, intensity as output. We'll look at, uh, 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 let's, let's, let's look at uh, uh, another note here actually right now. Um, so we've done that. So I'm the, I'm, so basically, uh, let me highlight a few steps here because this is detailed step that I generate a MATLAB code. Um, and I, uh, the MATLAB code is uh, um, attached in the, in the slides. You will see a little bit later. So let me uh, highlight a few steps. So the input is optical signal. It is not modulated. It's just simply sine omega t. 
And then we have two arms. So we have first arm and second arm. They have different faces. And the different faces, they should have a reference uh, point. And then, so the input modulation is like this. As the input. So I have a reference in the middle. So if I use the entire pi, then the reference is pi over two. And then the, the amplitude is uh, pi over four. So anyway, uh, these two faces I have to take some value. We can we can decide on this value a little bit later <clears throat> if you didn't follow me on pi over two, pi over four. <clears throat> so basically the two waves, they will have different phase rotations. Okay. And then after combining uh the so optical signal would have the intensity that is the cosine function so if uh the phase difference is zero then we have the high uh, intensity if the phase rotation is uh minus pi or pi depending on because we define the reference and amplitude here then the um uh the optical uh, power is low. So it corresponds to a uh, source uh, high and low. Data carrying at the high and the low. Um, so basically, when we define a reference and amplitude, we just reduce the range to a smaller range so that we use a near linear range for uh, so mapping be between electrical field to amplitude, amplitude field. Let's come back to the slides. So here we can we can basically we can use the whole uh, transfer function, but sometimes we only use a segment, and we sometimes shift it, so that we use a smaller linear uh, region for the for the mapping from electrical field to uh, optical field. So we need to define a reference point, and we also need to define the amplitude here. Basically, the range. Okay, so for uh, so I have the I diagram uh, in the in the electric uh, in the electrical field and then in the optical field. This distinction ratio here is a high power divided by low power. So if this is very high, it means the I is wide open. If this is low, then the eye is uh, kind of closed. So we want distinct, distinction ratio to be as high as possible. So for a full quam, a full, sorry, PM, we have four levels. So, uh, so this is example here, uh, we use uh, the entire uh, transfer function. So we see that the middle region is larger than the side region. So if we shift uh, the bars and we reduce the range, we use a smaller linear re uh, region, then uh, the three uh, three eyes uh, region, then uh, the three uh, three eyes they will be of a similar amplitude. So uh, the question is how to adjust, uh, the, how to shift this, and how to uh, reduce the range, how to shift this. So I attach uh, my lab code. It's actually quite simple. Uh, let's have a look at this. 
uh, the, the, the functionality of different parts together. Um, and you can copy and paste this program uh, into your MATLAB and then have a, a better understanding of how MZM works for, uh, for modulating light because this is uh, actually quite a very important um, element. So the first step is to define uh, parameters. So we have speed of light, we have wavelengths, we have operating frequency, we have symbol rate. Suppose we have uh, 100 uh, G beats per second. And then we have a uh, uh, oversampling ratio, uh, which means we, we make it more like a continuous uh, wave because this is the described time. So we over, uh, so we modulate uh, symbols and then we, we oversample, uh, we create uh, samples in the middle so that uh, the wave looks more like continuous uh, time wave. So the, f the first figure is uh, modulation, digital modulation. So for example, we have 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. We basically just modulate this to a, a BPS case, you know. So the first figure here, we have uh, the electrical modulation, 0, 1, 0, 0, one, one, zero. Okay. And then the second part, we have optical input signal. The optical input si signal basically is a uh, unmodulated signal. So if we look at the second figure, it doesn't contain any information. This is just a uh, unmodulated optical signal. And then we modulate uh, two arms. Uh, in the third part, we modulate we modulate arm one and arm two with a phase difference. And the phase difference would contain a shift in the reference and a shift in range. Uh, 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 a range that you, you define a short, maybe a shortened range. And then these two uh, uh, waves, they will combine to, again uh, as the other side of uh, MZM. So the two arms will combine. So the optical output here would have high and low. They represent zero, one, zero, zero, one one, zero, okay? So eventually we want to modulate the, it back so we receive optical signal and then we, we want to make a decision. We basically just test the power. So basically just test the power. So eventually based on the, based on the power low, high, low, low, high, high, low, we make a decision uh, that the signal we have uh, detected is zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Okay, so the code is similar for MGM, uh, sorry, for four uh, PM. It's just the input amplitudes. There are more variations because we have four levels. And then the second figure is a modulated optical signal. And then the intensity give us um, uh, carry information. So it was modulated by the phase difference between two waves on the two arms of MZM. And eventually based on the intensity, we make a decision. So MATLAB code is here. The steps for deriving the MATLAB code is uh, on the on the node I share to you. Here, here. So basically, we have uh, basic parameters. Uh, carry frequency wavelengths, uh, B 
bit rise and then oversampling. And then we have uh, NRJ modulation. And then we have input uh, optical signal. And then we have two arms. Uh, we modulate the two arms. And then uh, we combine the two signals and then evaluate the intensity. And then in the end, we do the modulation based on the power. So this is uh, all of these steps are uh, corresponding to the MATLAB code. Uh, so it would be helpful if uh, you have a look at this, uh, a look at the steps that modulate light and uh, have an uh, understanding of uh, the MATLAB code. If you have any questions, uh, send me an email. So that's all for lecture four. It's probably a little bit longer uh, because we we had a bank holiday and I, I want you to, I didn't, I didn't request um, um, reschedule our sessions because I supposed to have other uh, deadlines and other lectures uh, to, uh, for rescheduling. Um, so anyway, so this is uh, the transmitter. The next lecture will be uh, to re uh, for the optical receiver. So this is all for lecture four.